Well, turn in your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 1. I present to you something that I call The Voice, a series called The Voice, but I also call it The Voice 21 Challenge. In two decades of ministry, I've never attempted this, nor have I seen anyone else attempt it, and I'm about to find out if there's a reason for that. But nonetheless, I'm committed. I would like uh, to take one chapter a week and make our way through the Gospel of John and go through the entire book. Why? A lot of reasons. Let me give them to you. The church is in a state, and we are in a state, where we need to understand the author's original intent and something that was written. We cannot fully benefit from studying the scripture and and hearing sermons on the scripture unless we know the context and the flow and the purpose of why somebody wrote an entire body of work. That's why we go through the book itself. Why the Gospel of John? The Gospel of John is for new believers. It's a way to get yourself rooted and grounded in your new faith, but it's also a way to empower you and invigorate and refresh you in an already established and possibly seasoned faith. Why a challenge? Because the culture, the world, the church, you, me, all of us, for whatever reason, I don't want to go into it, are spending less time being discipled and more time attending church once a week. And you are not called to attend church once a week. You're called to live as a follower of Jesus Christ. And we need some preaching, but we also need some teaching. Said another way, we need some treaching. It concerns me to see men travel as often as they do, to be alone, women to be alone on the road as often as they are. It burdens me to see new people come to the faith and not have an ongoing, consistent process of discipleship. I aim to meet part of that need anyway through this series entitled The Voice. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Go and make students. Go and make followers. Teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Only after they're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In this series, I hope to do something that will be most beneficial. I hope to impart to you and those you don't know how to better study the Bible. This isn't just about fishing. It's about knowing how to fish, to know how to handle that book that you should have in your lap, how to open it into where you are and what's being said. How will this series affect your life? I don't know. It's to be determined, but it won't be for lack of challenge. Oftentimes, people stand in pulpits and ask people to to make goals about changing things in their life or changing or ridding themselves of certain things in their life or adding things to their life, and there's usually a short time frame to do that. Here's a luxury that I'm presenting to you today. I'm I'm going to be focusing on the Gospel of John for 21 sermons. This will take us to almost November There's plenty of time, a season, an epoch of time, an era of time for you throughout the summer and the early fall to make a change in your life, to rid yourselves of negatives and to add to yourself some positive qualities, as is true for me as well. To become a better student of the word would be a positive. To be a little more devoted to scripture, to know how to handle it, to know how to study it, to become a better worshiper, To become in any area of your life, to enhance or expand any area of your life that is within the will of God. That's a positive. Negatives. So you want to lose weight. You want to get in shape. Let's say you want to reconcile a relationship. Let's say you want to mend a marriage. Let's say you want to quit smoking. I'm challenging you on a 21-week period of time to have God speak to you 21 times out of each chapter to help you towards that goal. I'm giving someone who has a difficulty smoking 21 weeks to hear from God, to have some accountability, to chart a course, to get a plan, and to quit. A lot of things we do to make changes in our life are based on our own flesh. I'm offering you an opportunity to not base it on the flesh, but the spirit. I'm offering you an opportunity to frame what it is you are asking God to do through the course of a study of the Gospel of John and ask him to speak to you on a weekly, if not daily basis, on how to rid yourself or be set free from some of those things in your life. 
a change and a transformation rooted in Scripture rather than our own personal self-control and motivation and willpower. The results will be cataclysmically different between those two things. The Scripture and an adequate application of the Scripture over this series will do a couple things for us. It will show us the reasons for our behavior, the reasons for our weaknesses, and how to shore ourselves up the reasons and the rootedness behind the behavior, not just the behavior itself. That's a luxury that is afforded us as we go through an entire text. And in the Gospel of John, we will talk about the difference between light versus darkness. We'll be able to identify those areas in our life where we need a light shined in the darkness so the darkness would understand it. We will see a dichotomy between areas of our life that are life-giving and life-imparting and death giving and death in parting. Each Sunday, starting last Sunday, an email will be sent to this church. Today's email will be sent to you around 1221 today, preparing you for next week's lesson, message. And each of those blogs that will be sent to you will have action steps, reflections, prayers. I'll just give you a hint what I'm talking about. Next week, we're going to talk about John chapter 2, and we'll get around to talking about the money changers. One of the action steps is to ask yourself some questions what your relationship is to money, how you've planned for the future, how you haven't. And one of your action steps, if you choose to take the challenge, is to consider going out and eating somewhere and giving a 100% tip and see how you feel about it. We got to find out what the practical application is to the scripture in our everyday life. I want to marry those two things together. I don't want to have a Sunday church anymore. There are opportunities for discussion questions, action steps, small groups to meet. If you want to lead a small group, I'll help you do that. You'll have everything you need to carry out the task. The question is, are you willing to accept a challenge? In that challenge, I'm asking you to read that chapter for the week at least three times. I'd like more. I'd like for you to discuss, look at the discussion questions. I'd like you to do the devotion or two, and I'd like you to consider the best you can to take the action step. And they will get increasingly difficult for some of you. But you'll be following Jesus Christ. You'll be finding out what that looks like in your everyday life. You'll be stretched. You'll need courage. You'll need boldness. You'll need help. 21 chapters. So let's briefly do an overview. If you've got your Bible, turn to the book of John. We'll start today with a little preparation. Next week, we look at chapter two, the Winnie, the Keda, and the money changers. The following week, we'll talk about Jesus' encounter, one-on-one encounter with Nicodemus. Chapter four, we'll talk about the woman at the well. Chapter five, we'll look at the paralytic at the colonnade. I will be providing you with pictures as much as often as possible of the actual Israeli-Palestinian sites where these things took place. I'll do the best I can to take you to Israel without leaving the building. I want you to see where these things happen. I want you to feel where they happen. I want you to know about where they are in relation to one another, how much time was traveled between one event and the next, what the terrain was like, what the weather was like, what happened in and around in that village. I want to bring Israel to this sanctuary best I can. And I want this gospel of John and the rest of the New Testament to come so alive to you because you know how to handle it properly. Chapter 6, we'll talk about the feeding of the 5,000, the walking on the water. Chapter 7 is Feast of Tabernacles and the teaching. Out of of you will flow rivers of living water. Chapter 8, we're going to talk about the adulterer and the adulteress in our culture today. How do we love them, minister to them? How do we get them back on the straight track? And how are we actually adulterers and adulteresses? We're going to talk about the blind man in chapter 9, the good shepherd in chapter 10, Lazarus in chapter 11, and the stench of his death and the fragrance of worship in chapter 12 at Mary at the feet of Jesus. And we'll look at Jesus at the feet of the disciples in 13. And 14, we're going to learn how to establish some peace and direction in our life. As we get to 15, we are going to sit down and understand what the vine is all about and how we remain in him and where he wants to prune us. 16 and 17, we're going to look at the prayers of Jesus Christ and how he prepares himself, us, and the world and the Father for his departure. And then we're going to look at his arrest in chapter 18, his resurrection in chapter 19, and we're going to look at how he reinstates Peter at the end of the the Gospel of John. This is going to be life transforming. I want to talk to you about the author. The author is the Apostle John of the Gospel of John. 
Why did I pick John? Well, in part, he wrote this gospel, the last gospel. I think in a lot of ways he brings out things that the first three don't. He takes some approach. Ladies, he writes a lot like a woman. He's very detailed. He's going to give us descriptions we need. He's going to talk in concepts that we appreciate. He's going to give us things in the natural that tell us about things in the spiritual. We're going to talk about things like nard, oil, lambs, shepherds, vines, and what the spiritual implication is. By the end of this series, if you take this challenge and you walk with me, together with me, you're going to have a pretty good understanding of the book of John. You're going to be able to hold your own in any discussion with any atheist, with any new believer. You're going to be able to share the gospel. You're going to be able to look back and say, God ridded me of this. God added to me this. I decreased, he increased. Should you choose to take the challenge. He also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. I like him because he writes with anonymity. Never does he mention his name. I like him because he wrote Revelation. And anybody that wrote Revelation and had that kind of vision and been to the throne of God, I want to hear what they had to say leading up to that. That's the Gospel of John. He calls himself the elder. He understands false teaching. And he gives us his purpose. John 20, verse 30 and 31. Every week you're going to hear me say this because you can't understand the gospel of John without understanding why he wrote the gospel. We've got to teach one another how to understand the scripture. It's bad enough churches aren't preaching the truth. and It's worse, even worse, that we don't know how to handle the truth. We're going to do both in this place appropriately. Why did John write the gospel of John? Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe or continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I promise you this. I will work harder on this series than anything I've ever worked on before. I already have a year head start on you. I've been preparing these messages for a year. I've taught them 42 different times in this church. I promise you, I will do my best to be a workman approved. Would you promise me by the end of this service that you will falter and not condemn yourself, but you'll make the effort to listen to these messages, to get into the scripture, and to do what your pastor asks you to do to the best of your ability? That's what I'm asking you this morning. I'm asking you to make a move in your personal life and afford yourself the luxury of of both three or four months of diligent study the development of solid spiritual disciplines under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at John 1 through 18. We call it the prologue. In the beginning was the word. Logos is the word. In subsequent weeks, I'm going to teach you and I'm going to give you some websites on how to understand the meaning of Greek and Hebrew words. We'll get to that later. But for today, the New Testament is written in Greek. Logos is one of the most important words of all the New Testament. In the beginning was the Logos. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What is this Logos? It is God expressing himself. But not only does he express himself, it's inseparable from action. When God expresses himself through the written word, it's written with the intent and the expectation that there will be a divine action step accompanying that record of the word. God does not let his word return void because his word is the logos. It is activating. It is engaging. It is convicting. It is instructive. It is rebuking. It is corrective. It is encouraging. It is established. It is rooted. It is eternal. The Logos is eternal. It predates creation, people, and anything ever created. It is a foundation in which we stand. It is an anchor for your life. If you do not know how to handle the word of truth, you will eventually drift for lack of an anchor. And I'm going to hit that part home, but not just in a talking way. I'm going to get you to establish that firmly in your life. The Logos, eternal expression of God cultivates an action. It is, um, it is Christ, the Logos, made flesh. 
Uh, this Logos, this written word of God became flesh and walked around and everything he did was action, loving, kindness, compassion. It was uplifting. It was demonstrative. It was everything that God wanted to do through his word was done and communicated with action when Christ became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The Logos In the beginning was the word, the eternality of Christ. We can ill afford to worship some wimpy, easily offended Jesus. He is a king. He is eternal. Paul put it this way. The son is the image of the invisible God. You want to know the father? He said, look at me. The firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. You exist for his pleasure. I exist for his pleasure. We are his pocket change, it says in Hebrew. We exist for his pleasure. We have access to the courts of a king. We can enter a palace. We are the king's children. He has a kingdom. He has a rules. He has established law. He has everything we need to enjoy life. He is before all things in him. All things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. I want to study the Gospel of John and I want us to act on the Gospel of John because I want the supremacy of Jesus Christ to be elevated in our life where we no longer are Lord of certain areas, where we no longer have personal dominion over certain areas of our life. He does. John will do that for us. The Holy Spirit will do that for us. His supremacy. For God was pleased to have, pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. I like John because he lived a long time. He was persecuted. He is the disciple that Jesus loved. He had the ear of, of, the, of Christ. They talked about things other people didn't talk about. And if John has something to write about, and he talked about Jesus about things no one else talked about, then something that John wrote isn't going to be seen elsewhere. Because of the intimate relationship he had with Christ, I want to know more about what John had to say. I hope you do too. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John says, we've seen his glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I don't know what that would have been like. Can you imagine yourself on Lake Glenville one day in a pontoon boat, about $185 an hour? Some dude walks up on the shore and says, come follow me. You leave your contracting business. You leave the real estate deals that are not yet completed. You walk away from contracts. Hello. You no longer run in the country club. And you follow them. You head 85 miles south of here and you hang out in Gainesville preaching the gospel. What is that about? And you hang out with them and you laugh and you vacation and you walk, you tell stories, you make fires, you make fish, you go fishing, you run into some really weird people. A lot of people want to kill you. A lot of people can't stand you. And you walk with him. And then you get to write about it. And you say, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He became flesh. We arm wrestled together. Cried together. We got flat wore out together. We looked for wood as it was dark to make a fire together. He became flesh. And he meant everything to them. Three years they walked with him, they talked with him, they looked at him, they laughed, they cried, they got corrected. They have revelation with him. Everything changed. They looked back at that three years and said, I'm not the same person. Question, are you the same person you were three years ago? The word became flesh and dwelt among them. Then entered John the Baptist. Man, this guy's a character. He took what's called a Nazarite vow. 
What meaneth this? Some people here have taken the Nazarite vow. You don't cut your hair. You don't go near anything dead. And you don't drink wine. Samson and Samuel took the Nazarite vow. What does Nazar mean? Nazar means separate or cut up, set apart, consecrated. Nazareth was a place set apart, consecrated. No one liked it. And no one liked the people that came out of it. John the Baptist lived in the Judean wilderness, in the desert, near the Mount of Temptation. He came from a community called Qumran, and this is where we get the Dead Sea Scrolls. 20,000 manuscripts found in 1948 by a Bedouin boy who threw a rock into a cave and heard something clink and went in there and found that he broke a clay jar, just trying to scare his goat out of a cave. And out of that cave came so many tens of thousands of manuscripts you can actually go to Israel today and look at Isaiah 61, right there in its fullness, preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, he was a Nazarite. He was special. He lived a special life. He got up in the morning and he wrote down the scripture. And every time he went to take a break or go to the bathroom or get something to eat, he took another bath before he came back. He cleansed himself in water. It's called a mikvah. He wanted to make himself pure every time he came back to write more of the scripture. That's the kind of life he lived. He ate locusts, we'll tell you. He didn't get out much. He didn't go to many restaurants. He was dedicated to anything and everything he ever did. He was sensitive to Jesus Christ as an infant. He flipped in the womb when Mary showed up. He lived in this Qumran community and he baptized in the Jordan River. Some of you have been baptized in the Jordan River. That was fun. He makes this comment in 120. He says, I am not the Messiah. He was baptizing all these people and they came to look at it and they go, what's so special about this guy? He's got a following. What's happening with this John the Baptist? And the first thing he says, let me tell you something, I'm not the Messiah. And that's another reason to look at the gospel of John. Because in some areas of our life, in many areas of our country, I even get annoyed when we assign the word Messiah to certain people running for office. Come on. There's one Messiah one anointed one, Jesus the Christ. And John, this is John. Let me tell you something. I am not the Messiah. Don't want any notoriety. I don't want any attention. I just want to eat my locusts, I'll copy down things on paper. I'll go into the river. I don't want to untie his sandals. I'm just to be left alone. He had such a purpose and mission in life. When he fulfilled it, his life ended. He couldn't top what he did. He prepared the way for the Lord. In verse 23, he says, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. He's quoting Isaiah 40 and 3. By the way, in your New Testament, when something is indented, that's because it's an Old Testament prophecy. If you look through your New Testament and looked at all the Old Testament prophecies and took them out, you wouldn't have much left. The New Testament is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. And all those indentations are just nothing more than quotes from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the root. The New Testament is the fruit. He says, I'm just a voice. And that's why this series is called The Voice. You're going and I'm going to learn how to be more sensitive to the voice of God. And we're going to look at people who had no voice whatsoever and encountered this Christ and left that encounter with an incredible voice crying out in the wilderness, making a difference in people's lives. The voice. Then he says in 129, behold the Lamb of God. I want you to behold the Lamb of God. I want us to look at Christ in a new, fresh, different way. I want you to do it through the reading of scripture, through prayer. I want you to converse with one another about it. We're gonna talk about it until we're blue in the face. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. This Jesus you and I see is deeper, richer, more expansive, more loving, more compassionate, more in charge, more authoritative than we realize. You cannot define this Christ. If you've defined him, some of you have been walking with him a long time, you think you've got him figured out. And you say, no, I haven't. But your behavior says you have. He'll stretch you. He'll, he'll put you in dangerous situations. You'll have to take even greater risk. You'll have to trust him with even greater trust. And he'll reveal another dimension, another facet of the depth of his love and his power in your life. 
If your Jesus is predictable, you're not done figuring him out yet. If this Jesus doesn't cost you anything, you haven't even begun to pick up your cross daily, deny yourself, and follow him. If he's not asking something of you that is gonna require an incredible amount of trust and faith, you're not done figuring him out yet. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. You might be a week or two out of the chute where you're gonna see him in a whole new light, and it's gonna be exciting. I'm concerned about you who have been walking with him for 65 years, and you think you're done. You haven't even begun, nor have I to figure out the expanse and the dimensions and the the multiplicity of facets of Jesus Christ. Behold the lamb. Study the lamb. Talk to the lamb. Worship the lamb. Share the lamb. Just when we figure out who he is and we think we know and we love him, I tell you what, we become self-sufficient and we crash and burn like nobody's business. Behold the Lamb of God, he said. What a mouthful. Some of the disciples started to figure out this Jesus and they go, I'm gonna find out who he is. They started to tail him. They started to follow him. And he turns around and he said a word to him and it's just incredible. He said in verse 38, he says, what do you want? These guys are kind of like in the background checking him out. Let's see what he does. Let's see where he goes. Let's follow him on Facebook. Let's cyber stalk him. Let's figure out who this Jesus is. And he looks around and he says, what is it that you want? Question. What is it that you want? What is it that you want? See, when you establish that, you open up the gospel and you just go get it because it's waiting for you. What do you want? What do you want? What do you need? What breaks your heart? Who breaks your heart? I'm offering you 21 messages of putting together a prayer strategy to pray that prodigal back home. I'm offering you an opportunity for 21 messages to bring someone along with you in prayer and in study. In every prayer you pray for yourself, you pray it for them. In everything you see in the word, you pray they see it as well. I'm asking you to walk with someone else by faith and intercede for them as you go through this study together. These opportunities don't come along often. What do you want? They asked Jesus this question, where are you staying? They wanted to follow him and then they wanted to camp outside his tent and figure out what he was doing. Ah, here's the same question I have for you. What do you want? And number two, where is Christ staying in your life? Where is he most welcome? Where is he tabernacling or dwelling in your life? And where is he not? In what area of your life do you not sense his involvement, his wisdom? In what area of your life are you confused? You're reticent to make a decision. How do we take these messages and this gospel and get him into those areas where he seemingly is not from our perspective? Where are you staying, Jesus? And then he finally said to them in verse 43, follow me. Just follow me. Just follow me. Everybody wants to lead few want to follow. And those who lead don't have any clue what it means to follow. So there it is. There's your opportunity to get creative and think about what could be done. You say to yourself, well, I won't be here the whole time. Got you covered there. I don't attend the church. Got the people covered there. Every one of these times together, every one of these times we fellowship around the word will be online. It'll be accessible to you. It won't be that long. It won't be some long, drawn-out sermon. It's not going to be dry. It's going to be informative to the point and well-prepared, ready for some action steps. Will you discern the voice of God? Will I discern the voice of God and will I acquire a voice in my wilderness and will you acquire your voice in yours? 
If a woman at the well that nobody liked and no one wanted to be around could have a personal encounter with Jesus and leave that in a situation saying, come see a man who told me everything I ever did, you and I are capable of doing the very same thing. Find your voice. So I offer you a journey, a fresh start, a season of change. I offer you an encounter with the word and an encouragement behind it. And I offer you also an encounter with the Holy Spirit. When we get to near the end of this time together in this gospel, some of you are going to see the Holy Spirit in a whole new light. Some of you are going to see the Holy Spirit in a light. Some of you are going to embrace the Holy Spirit. Some of you are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And some of you are going to really say to yourself, how did I miss the purpose behind the Holy Spirit my whole entire life? This is what I'm excited about.